Okie dokes. Hello, hello, Chantel Martin. So it's so great to see you. And uh, I think in this third episode of my lockdown series, we are really <laughs> zooming into the wonderful mind and heart of one of my favorite artists and people. And uh, the idea here is just to explore, uh, well, first still one hour of your lockdown, but then also explore how you're doing, what you're learning about yourself and about the state of humanity in general in these uh, weird times. So first of all, where are you and how are you? Yeah, we're efficient people. I think we'll squeeze that down for 45 minutes, but uh, thank you for having me in your top three. I'm at home in Jersey City, New Jersey. And uh, yeah, I've been here for about a month and a half now. Okay, and uh, how is the lockdown working out for you and what have you learned about yourself since you are somebody who is always in self-exploratory mode or mode? Mm -hmm. What about this last six weeks or so? I don't know if you felt this, but you know, so it's been about six weeks since we've been locked down. Uh, you know, if you walk out on the streets here, I think people forget that there's a lockdown and you have to, you know, I feel like I'm playing the game of Pac-Man where I'm avoiding people that look like there's nothing really happening at the moment. But, um, you know, before this happened, I was in Toronto, Sydney, DC, you know, I was flying all over the place. And since this has happened, I've been no further than probably five blocks from, you know, my home. And, you know, time has still flown by. So even though when I think about it, I've only been, you know, a few, maybe not even a mile from my house in like six weeks. But at the same time, it still feels like I've been everywhere because in my mind, I kind of have, you know, I, I feel like a lot of us haven't really slowed down. We're still busy. We're still having meetings. We're still doing 20 different things at once. Um, so I have to just sit down and be like, oh, wait, I am in this surreal moment where things have stopped in the world and all of this stuff is happening. I have to constantly check in and remind myself that that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Do you get bored? You know, when is there time to be bored? You know, have you been bored in this time? No, I think I find it's the opposite. I find less time oddly, even though we're not so much on the road and I'm sure, do you miss the traveling? I don't miss the traveling actually, you know, it, um, you know, when you think about it, what is it about traveling that you would actually like? You know, it's like airports, bad food, you know, lots of waiting, uncomfortable seats. Uh, so I've definitely not missed that. Um, you know, I've, there's lots of things I've wanted to do. I don't know if you've had a chance, but you know, for about four weeks now, I'm like, great, I'm going to make music. Next week, I'm going to make music. Next week, I'm going to make music. Next week, I'm going to make music. And I even said it today, okay, next week, I'm going to make music. So there's still these things that I want to do that I still haven't found time to actually do or I haven't made the time to do them. Yeah, yeah. So talk to me a little bit and for the people who are watching this and don't know how you got to where you are right now career-wise, what your career trajectory has been, where you started where you got to and maybe where you're going next, if you want to give us a glimpse of the future. It was a big question. I would say I'll answer the question. And then if you're not satisfied, go to YouTube. And on YouTube, I have a nice three or four part series called Come What May. And in that series, I talk about kind of where I grew up in Southeast London. I grew up in a place called Thamesmead. And uh, you might recognize Thamesmead from like Clockwork Orange or the Misfits or car commercials you know I grew up in one of these uh kind of brutalist projects you know very ugly very gray uh not much hope or imagination really you know no offense to anyone else that's from there um but you know I, I grew up in South East London in Thamesmead and never ever imagined that I would be an artist never even knew that that was something that you could do but you know you you kind of you wake up every day and you live your life and you go to school and then you leave school and you get jobs and you know, you're always hoping that something better will happen and you, you're basically surviving, but surviving and pushing yourself in a direction where everything hopefully is a little better, a little better, a little better, a little better, a little better. And then you move to Japan and you start teaching English for a little bit. Um, so I lived in Japan for five years 
And actually that's where I started my career as an artist. I, I was a VJ, a visual jockey. So I would do visuals to DJs and dancers and musicians. And um, it was an incredible time, um, you know, spent many hours in, in clubs dancing and just enjoying life. This is and sort then of after the five, end of the Japanese avant-garde clubbing scene, basically. Yeah, yeah. I was kind of like in between all those worlds. I was doing, you know, drawings and visuals in these avant-garde clubs and, you know, doing drawings to like blue toe dancers and, and you know, people who made their own instruments through circuit bending and, and super fun stuff like that. And then, you know, the next night I might be in like a Japanese mega club with like a German DJ, you know, spinning like minimal tech funky house. Um, where it's you know super high tech and bold and, and fun. And, and so you I, had I to it. improvise uh, digital animations that go with the music basically on the spot with computer. Exactly, exactly. So I would be you know spontaneously drawing digitally and sometimes analog, uh, live to the music, live to the DJs, live to the dancers, uh, live to the bands. And you know you imagine you know the, the music's playing and then I'm drawing and, and doing my thing. And that's how I started my career, this spontaneous, improvised, subconscious, drawing, not thinking, just allowing to the music, to the beat. And then after my set, you know, I'd go off and be even, you know, dancing myself or, you know, um, whatever else I used to get myself into. Okay, and then that's, that was Tokyo, but then you got to New York, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I moved to New York in 2009. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was funny because when I moved to New York, all of that world that, you know, I was used to now in Japan and where I started my career didn't exist in New York. And so, you know, you could say in a way that I de-evolved. And instead of doing this club stuff, this avant-garde stuff, I was, you know, simply picking up a pen and saying, hey, like, this is accessible all of that stuff that existed in Japan doesn't exist to me now, but I can draw on people. I can draw on my walls. I can draw on paper and, you know, kind of that, that New York artist hustle of just, just trying to survive again, just trying to do what you love, um, trying to, you know, one step after another, but in the direction where you're trying to improve, you know, every single day. Yeah. And so then you found your um, kind of emblematic and distinctive style, which we can see behind you. And I have to say your artwork is much nicer than my artwork, um, <laughs> especially right now, even though at home I have something that looks like a small version of that, which uh, I got from you. So, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm treasuring very nicely on my, on my real desk uh, that is now empty. How did you find um your style i guess and uh you know you you skipped the bit about your art education obviously you went to central st martin so you always toyed or or yeah, who cares about the, the education idea, <laughs> had the idea of becoming an artist but you know some people watching you now will see that there is uh, an inherent need to create and then you also went to music so how do you find since are you you and being you is such a big theme in your art how does one found, find himself or herself yeah and uh, how can people awake the inner artists inside them if they have one does everyone have have one or is it just uh, a calling you know talk to me about finding your style and your artistic kind of a vignette or personality yeah that was like 10 questions in one but um you know, I, I did go to art school. I, I first actually, I went to Campbell College of Arts and I did a, a foundation year. In England, we do like a one year foundation. And then after that, you know, um, kind of what's the hardest school to get into? It was Central St. Martin's, you know, it's a school with a big fancy name and reputation. And um, so I, I went to Central St. Martin's, but I don't think I really found my voice or my style. And maybe found is the wrong word. Maybe it's more like extracted. Um, I extracted that style or that fingerprint or that identity in Japan drawing to clubs. Because, you know, imagine if you're drawing in the clubs to, to music for hours and hours and hours, you're not thinking, you're not planning. It's not an exercise. It's not a class project. Um, 
you're not hesitating, you're not being insecure, you're just drawing. And you do that and you do that for hours and hours and hours and hours. Essentially what you're doing is just extracting yourself, extracting your style, extracting your fingerprint. And the more you do it, the more confident you become in that. And so the style, I, I guess, initially was extracted through that career path in Japan. And then, you know, moving to then New York, um, that extraction perhaps translated into a different medium, you know, more of a pen versus this kind of like digital live performance. Um, and, you know, asking these questions, you know, that there's like a you are use and affirmation and the are you use and the, and the who are you's, you know, I think everyone does have that inner artist in themselves, but we don't all have the opportunity to exercise that. And, you know, you, you have small children now is, you see, we all, we all naturally draw as children. Like we all do it. We, you know, for some reason, I'm sure some of it is about motor skills and kind of homing in, you know, kind of hand eye coordination. But another part of it is just that it's a gift that we're all given as adults, or I should say as children to create and to make and to extract it's just that kind of along the way, like a lot of us are taught that we shouldn't do it or we can't do it or other people do it better. Instead of looking at it as a gift that we're all given that allows us to translate things from our head to our hand and deal with the external environment that we're existing in. And so, yes, we all have it in us. There is a benefit to those skills that a lot of us ignore. Um, and so, you know, if you can, and you can pick up a pen and draw. Yeah, I think I was remembering, I think it's Picasso who said that at the age of five, he could paint like uh, Raphael or one of the Rena Renaissance masters, but it took him all his life to learn to draw or paint like a child. And uh, <laughs> so there is this sort of uh, childlike quality to your art. There is also like this stream of consciousness quality and I think it's very psychological your art because there's this self-exploration aspect of who are you identity etc um, so that's your artwork which is amazing and I love but do you approach living your life in a sort of artistic way do you think about you know the way that uh, you go on about interacting with others or just going on about like regular life is that, is that an artwork as well? Or is there an artistry there? Or is it just completely detached from you, the artist? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. You know, I think those two are kind of melted together. And, you know, whatever I'm doing versus it, if, it, if it's art or not art, it still has my voice. It still fundamentally has my DNA or uh, kind of... Um, I'm a part of its bones. So, you know, it could be doing something that is traditionally thought of artwork or it could be something outside of that, but I'm going to bring myself, I'm going to bring that identity. I'm going to bring that fingerprint. I'm going to bring that voice to it. And I think, you know, being an artist, um, one of the things it does allow is it allows you to um, have that voice and have that identity and have that fingerprint and have it kind of on the surface so you can have it in the way that you wear, the way that you interact, the way that you present yourself, in your philosophy, in the way that you draw, in the way that you play music, in the way that you perhaps design things or play a role in things. Um, it's just that I think as artists, it's, it's more accepted that we are able to bring that into other areas of our life. And that's something I definitely do do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's talk about, you know, uh, snobism or snobbery in the world of art? I mean, do you think that art is something that uh, needs to be accessible and for the masses or does it belong to curators, gallery and uh, critics? Where, where do you see your art and art in general? Where should it be? Yeah, well, you know, imagine this. As a living artist, I make the art and people who enjoy the art consume the art. And then now we have all these people in between, art advisors, creators, da, 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 da. they need to feel some importance or some achievement from the living artists that are creating the work and the consumer. And so therefore we have to create this facade to make everyone else 
who is not actually making the art in between these two people now feel important, now feel needed, now feel accepted, now feel that they are educated in, in what is happening. And so, you know, it's a lot of it is just, it's a bunch of BS. And, you know, I was just actually, I was talking to someone about the, you know, the beginnings of ballet, you know, and, and ballet was created by like King Louis, the something that wanted to dance. And so he put himself and he created these theaters around himself. And, you know, and essentially ballet in the 1840s and 50s and 60s was wedding entertainment for fancy European um, families. And so it's basically like, you know, we take ballet so seriously. Yes, it is beautiful. And, and yes, it has this history, but actually it started as wedding entertainment. Um, yeah, so it was like re reggaeton or electronic music uh, back in the days, <laughs> like, right? Or, or yeah, like I'm a rave. A like, rave. Yeah, it was like hired, hired dance to entertain some people. Um, you know, it's like now you'll, you know, you have someone, you'll hire someone for your kid's bar mitzvah. You know, back in the 1800s, you hire someone for your cousin's wedding. Um, and, and so, you know, but, but for it to be important and to feel justified, we create these stories and these facades around it. And, you know, it's just, it, it is what it is now. It's like, um, you know, artists work incredibly hard to um, extract themselves, to tell a story, to connect with people. Yet the people that are able to afford typically to consume their art don't really care so much about what the artist is trying to say. It's more about this market and what the importance of that market is trying to say about them. And, and so, you know, it's, it's one of these things is like, I'm just trying to be very transparent with myself. I'm, I'm an artist that's trying to make art that believes that there is a benefit to people from consuming art and from creating art themselves. Not everyone should be an artist in their career, but yes, everyone should have some form of head to hand art making outlet because it's just good for you um we maybe we should justify or make people who have the means to spend money on art feel very good and very educated and and, and very proper but there is a way of doing that and being transparent and i just think you know just kind of peeling back some of the facades that we've created around this world there'll be, uh, you know, there, there'll be a benefit for everyone. Yeah. Do you think people like Banksy kind of bridge the gap or will that be an example of someone who seems uh, adored by the masses and people consume his art without, you know, major, I suppose his own marketing machine as well, but do you think that will be an example of very mass market or popular art something that people don't need critics to say oh you should like this this is amazing um you know i think everyone you know essentially as an artist what are you initially trying to do you're trying to be creative you're trying to survive you're trying to get a message out there and you know i, I don't know so much about his work but i think you know it started off as good storytelling as good messaging as good trying to get stuff out there and then it evolves into like any business, like really good marketing strategy, you know, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's about telling that story to bring in the consumers so that you can make a, a, more of a return on your investment. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think there is commentary there, but the commentary is also playing a role in the commerce of consumption and the people that can afford it. And these people want to, feel like they're propped up on this pedestal and that they get it and that they're smart and that they understand it. And so if you can play into that and then make money from that, then, you know, great. Like, I think it's just very smart uh, marketing. Mm -hmm. So, and in that you obviously um, focus or pay attention to that storytelling as well. And since a lot of the work you do is, uh, I don't know if it's the correct term, but performance based or live installations or, uh, you go and, you know, there is a showmanship there uh, that is included. Um, I think it's fair to say that you are part of the artwork in a way, and uh, you also have to brand yourself and sell yourself, right? Is that, how did you learn that? Did, is that part of your personality? Is it something that you can train, practice, where you look at a role model and said, okay, you know, I'm sort of a part of the package. Where, where did that come yeah. from? 
can I ask you the same question? Because I think, you know, you're in a very different field to me, but I think it's the same thing, you know, in a way, um, you're packaging yourself, you're going on stages, you're writing books, you know, you're, you're putting out a certain image and persona. And so I'd love to ask you that question first. Mm -hmm. I mean, but in, you know, in my field or area, it's very boring because you're still delivering a presentation and it's conventional and the format is there and there's no creativity and you can be a little bit funnier or less funnier and try to entertain more or less and maybe try to be more charismatic or engaging or less. And I think, some of that, at least for me, is personality-based. In the beginning, I was quite fearless and overconfident, and I thought I was great even if I was not. Then you realize that you're actually not that good, but you work on it, right? So I think you have a base that you start with, and then you try to uh, eliminate or reduce your defects. But it's still, I focus a lot on the content and the message, and then, you know, people the added value is not whether they enjoy the experience or the entertainment as much. Yeah. I think for you, you are, they're immersed and you are part of the art that they're consuming, right? Then I'm sure people yeah. can go to your site and see that. So is that something that you learned or you feel you, it's part of, you know, your personality the way you are? Yeah, you know, a couple of things. So, you know, firstly, it's important that you are doing those things because if you're not, someone else is. And it's also important that you're doing those things. Otherwise, people would just consume your work and not care if you're out presenting it or not. And I think it's quite similar in what I'm doing. For me, I'm not, um, it's, it depends what you care about. For me, I don't care about art that is just sitting on a wall, that we had no idea how it got there. And then it's sitting on a wall in a frame in a building with a locked door, essentially. And so for me, there's so much distance between how the work got there. And then I go and stand in front of it and look at it. And I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah that's, that's nice. That doesn't interest me, you know, to a certain point, perhaps, you know, I want this to be as beautiful as it is and perhaps framed nicely and have a great craftsmanship. But for me, what is important is about how it got there and the process it took to get there. And so, you know, by default, it becomes a performance in showing how the work got there by actually creating the work in a live environment or, um, you know, pulling down some of those layers that of protection and being transparent and saying, this is how the work's created and I'm going to show you how it's created and I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking about as I'm creating it because there creates a sense of honesty and um, connection and experience when I do that. So if I invite you into my space and you become a part of that experience of the work being created, then you become a part of the work when it goes on the wall. And so I think, you know, it's not because I'm a performance artist. I don't actually think I'm a performance artist, but I'm someone that sees the benefit in allowing people into the process. And so let's talk about your music now. Are you applying some of that thinking rationale method to making music as well or playing music? Or how did you decide to switch from drawing or painting onto music? And what have you learned about your own talents, you know, when you're, when you're switching from one to another? You know, it's, it's interesting because I think initially, like a lot of us, we start to draw or create or make because it is an outlet you know there is a benefit that we do get from it and for me you know there was a point where the drawing and the creating and the making did become work um, I'm still enjoying it but now there are deadlines there are things I have to do there are places the work needs to be and so I think I needed some kind of other creative outlet where it wasn't attached to go into a place or being done at a certain time. And so for me, that became the music and a piano or a keyboard. And I realized for myself that, oh, you know, playing keys is like drawing. You know, if I'm drawing and it's mostly black and white, and when I'm drawing, it has to be super confident and bold without hesitation and with repetition, then if I play the keys in the same way, confidently with repetition without hesitation and you know with kind of a nice pattern there then it's the same as drawing but i'm just drawing with music and wanting to bring in that 
what I started to do is like when I first started making music is I would um, create shows. So I performed, you know, at places like Rockwood Music Hall and, you know, and, and other venues where I would invite an audience and I would say, hey, like, I don't know how long this is going to be, how short it's going to be, how happy it's going to be, how sad it's going to be. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I'm not a pop band. I'm not a pop singer. I'm, I'm none of that, but this will be an experience. And then I would play. And for me, you know, it almost gave me that outlet or that connection with the spontaneity and the intu and intuitiveness of the work that I did when I first started drawing in the clubs. So then I would just play. And then when I would play, I would visualize words and then the words would come to me. And then I would do like, for a lack of a better word, spoken wordy playing stuff. And sometimes it'd be very angry and very dark. And sometimes it would be funny and uh, comical. And, and so I realized like, oh, well, I, I, music for me is an outlet. Like I still have all this like dark, angry stuff in me that I need to get out. And I don't get it out from drawing anymore because drawing is moving in this direction where it's becoming lighter and freer and more whimsical. And it's moved from this dark place and it's going to this light place. But I still have these things that I need to deal with and get out. And music became that outlet. And so I truly believe that it doesn't matter what industry or what medium you're creating in. If you put your true self behind it, it will look like you. It will feel like you. It will sound like you. Um, it is you because you've put your authentic true self behind it. So it's fascinating. And, you know, I, there must be, you must feel um, very vulnerable when you're doing that do you think you have to be super confident fearless and strong to go and open up like that or um is that something i mean you know and how do you feel afterwards do you feel stronger better more open more real yeah. true to yourself i'm 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 not in drastic yeah <laughs> i'm not in a lot it's so true especially with the music um I would be so nervous before I would start. And I, you know, I'd feel a little bit like, Ugh, like I don't feel good because I know that I'm doing something that I have to be incredibly vulnerable and I have to be incredibly open to go there and not even know where I'm going. Yeah. And um, you also have to trust yourself going there. You know, you have to trust that you can deliver something that will be a unique, authentic experience. Um, actually, when I was playing live with the music stuff after, I would feel really embarrassed. Um, I'd feel so horribly embarrassed after because I literally just was like, here I am. And um, it's such a new experience. And so, you know, I, I still, I don't enjoy that. I don't enjoy this feeling of putting myself out there and being so vulnerable and so open. And that would make me incredibly, incredibly embarrassed. But the point is, is that there's some part of me that enjoys that. It enjoys it because the creativity that comes from it. Um, it I enjoy it because it puts me in a really scary place. And I think that's actually how we grow and how we evolve is by scaring ourselves and putting ourselves in these creative, vulnerable situations. So do you feel nervous sometimes ahead of the performance? Do you feel kind of uh, anxiety or butterflies in your stomach? It's, it's more embarrassed. Like, I, I kind of feel like, oh, you know, I'm sorry for what I'm going to do. Like this, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and I think that's because I'm sorry because I'm not confident in what I'm doing, but that's why I'm doing it because I want to become confident. Like yeah. I'm unapologetic when I'm drawing because I know I can turn up and draw. And I know that that line is as crisp and as confident and as controlled as it can ever be. And so I'm not ever going to apologize for my line that I'm going to make. But when it comes to music, I know that I have so much to learn and there's so much growing that needs to be done that I'm s almost apologizing that I'm bringing you on this journey with me because we haven't got to the end yet but then I think at the same time that's what makes it quite beautiful yeah so let's uh, change gears slightly and tell me how you're seeing the world behave 
uh, in this crisis and respond to these uh, crazy events? You know, when you look at humanity, what are your thoughts? I mean, uh, do you feel optimism? Are you disappointed? Do you feel faith? What's your, has, has this changed your take on civilization, humanity, or your opinion of people in general? Yeah, <laughs> good question. You know, um, I have one word for that, and I think it's accountability. With any and most situations, there is really no serious accountability for the people pulling the strings and making the decisions. And that could be from going to war illegally and killing a few tens of thousands of people. Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. I'm going to retire. Or, you know, making people go and work in a meat factory where it's not safe and say, if you don't do it, we're going to take away your unemployment and we're going to, you know, put all this other pressure on you when those people get sick and perhaps infect other people and those people die, there's no accountability. You know, when, when the government just, and governments put out misinformation and don't take care of people, you know, there's no accountability because we, we, have so many layers of protection from protecting the people who are actually kind of really pulling the strings and have like multi billions and trillions of dollars that we never really look up, you know, we're always distracted and blaming each other. And so, you know, my, my theory or theories on humanity, you know, are quite um, pessimistic and, you know, I'm a, a big believer in, in, in the hypocrisy of it all because you know never ever ever do we just say wait like who's pulling the strings and who has all the money and who is all doing that because there's so many layers of protection and there's no account real accountability on those levels mm. what about the behavior of everyday people you know from the interactions you have or when you look at how people are do you think there's a there's a sense that this can bring people not the system but most people together and improve the way we behave or does it have the opposite effect or does it not change things? You know, I think most people in general, you know, I'm here in Jersey city and you know, it's interesting because you know, you, you go online and everyone's like, you know, let's protect frontline workers and let's do this. And people clapping outside their windows and then you walk out, you know, to walk your dog and there's people in groups of people, there's people hugging people on the street. There's like five, guys sitting on the corner there it's like is in theory are people really caring and really taking you know precaution and you know people are texting me and stuff and being like oh what's it like in lockdown there and I'm like wait is there a lockdown you know I don't think there is a lockdown it's basically if you have common sense you do x to try and protect yourself and others um, but it doesn't seem like common sense is something that everyone has um, and I don't even know if it's common sense, but it's more so of like, I feel fine, so I'm going to do what I want. Um, and I don't care if I'm potentially aff affecting or infecting anyone else because this is what I want to do. And, you know, I think on a human to human level, that's it. We just have a lot of people, especially here in the US, that just want to do what they want to do, regardless of who or how it might impact people. Mm -hmm. So do you think in, in some ways the world will change after this? And if so, I don't know if you've given this any thought, but, uh, you know, what's the new not normal like or what things will never be the same after this enters like the next phase or whatever? You know, I think everything's, everything's like an elastic band, right? You know, there, there's an elastic band. You pull it and it changes form and it does different things, but you let go and, you know, after enough time, it just goes back to its normal shape because, you know, people forget very quickly. And if you look at history, one thing that is definitely sure is that there is institutional and generational memory loss. And so I think on some level, yes, things will change and there will be some innovations and there will be some, uh, you know, kind of efforts to... Uh, move and shift technology where there is a financial benefit for people but I think in the long run you know we do forget so fast and we do forget very quickly um, it's just sometimes the the 
the, the cause is um, so big that, you know, maybe the effects of forgetting take a little bit longer. But I think we'll get there eventually. Yeah. And on technology, and, you know, I'm sure this is like the 10th Zoom meeting that you had today. And it's uh, coming up to 520 here in the East Coast. Um, you know, how do you find that? increased level of interaction with technology you know in the beginning of the crisis i thought actually for a lot of people they would rather be in lockdown with wi-fi and watch tiger king and have netflix <laughs> etc than being being able to go outside and not have internet access for a year you know because we've been so we are so dependent yeah. on it. how are you finding that even bigger reliance on technology and the fact that now most of our interactions with others, you know, you're looking at a screen and it's technologically mediated. Yeah. Well, technology now, especially why, you know, Wi-Fi is an essential resource, you know, it's like food, water, Wi-Fi. Um, so we're definitely seeing it as an integral and necessary part of our life to communicate, to do business, um, to even socially and so you know it'll be interesting to see how that evolves and how that develops um but you know it's also quite interesting how you know when all of this happened the first two weeks everyone's like oh my god I'm, I'm so bored I've got nothing to do and then two weeks later everyone's like said oh I had 20 zoom meetings today and it just shows you how quickly we just kind of changed into this new space and into this new rhythm um, and into these kind of new tools. Uh, and it just really didn't take that much time at all for people to get used to it. And so I think coming out of this, you know, a lot of people are asking themselves, like, wait, did I have to go on a plane to go to that meeting? Or did we have to get the ball together in physically to have that meeting? Did we have to do this if we could have done this? And so, you know, I think it is a time for us to ask ourselves and others, what actually do we need to be doing? What is necessary to get the task and the job done? And what is unnecessary? Yeah. So it's been really, really wonderful to catch up. What is the best place for people to find out more about what you do, who you are, and uh, all of the amazing creations that you are producing? Is it your website? Why don't you tell us? So first, you know, go to your bookshop, you know, all those other places and, and buy a copy of Lines, L-I-N-E-S. It's my Especially first Especially if book. uh, bookstores exist and uh, are somewhere. Yeah, you can buy it. If you don't want to go to the big giant, you know, that begins with an A, you can go, you know, call up your local bookshop. And I think a lot of the bookshops are still shipping, but go and buy a copy of Lines. It's my first ever art book. I know you have like 20 books out there, but this is like my, my first book. So go buy a copy of Lines and you're going to see work there from like the last 15 years of my life, pretty much. And then, you know, website, chantelmartin.com, S-H-A-N-T-E-L-L-M-A-R-T-I-N.com and Instagram, you know, my name. So I, I'm pretty easy to find as long as you spell my name right. And uh, yeah, go, go buy a copy of the book um, because I'm not on a book tour, obviously. I'm in my living room. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And I have ordered a copy of lines on, on the big bookstore that, uh, you just suggested <laughs> not to, but, uh, it's, it's the safest way of getting it delivered. And as I mentioned, uh, true, my daughter true. seems to, seems to fancy herself as a young three-year-old, three and a half year old Chantel Martin. So there she is, uh, yeah. copying your style. And, uh, I think if there is another lawsuit or a copyright breach dispute, it will be with her involving her. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm enjoying you. seeing some yeah. of my <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Anyway, stay well. And, uh, as always great to catch up. Thank you, Chantel. Cool. Ciao. See you soon.